Right, good morning everybody. So, um, welcome back to another podcast, I'm uh, uh, video log. I'm currently in Victoria uh, on my Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship, looking at the mobile intensive care paramedics in Australia, the intensive care paramedics in New Zealand, and I'll be going to work with the High Cuta Response Unit in Brisbane next week, which will be really interesting. It's all part of my project to try and improve or look at development pathways for pre-hospital critical care in the UK for paramedics. Uh, learning from working with some of these, um, uh, these uh, critical care paramedics, intensive care paramedics from across the world. So I'm pretty excited today because I'm currently sitting next to Ben Meadley, who's a flight paramedic from Victoria Ambulance, Ambulance Victoria in Victoria in Australia. And we've spent the day yesterday on the helicopter working together and today I'm just really going to have a chat to him about his role, his background and a little bit about Ambulance Victoria and their, um, their development of the mobile intensive care pathway. So thank you for having a chat, Ben. No it's worries, good to see you. Right, so you've been working for the Ambulance Service now for 22 years. About that, yeah. Would you just mind explaining to me and to everybody else what, uh, what your career background is really, how you got to do what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, sure. So I started out with an undergraduate degree in exercise science. That was the path I was headed on with a bit of research in, in that world. But uh, I don't know, found a, a calling to being a paramedic. I uh, kind of wanted to explore that medical side of things rather than necessarily just the, the high performance side of things. And, uh, and started as a paramedic in Sydney. Uh, worked there for nearly five years, um, uh, having come originally from Melbourne. Came back to Melbourne, uh, worked in the system in uh, metropolitan Melbourne for a couple of years before I did my intensive care or, or mobile intensive care ambulance or MICA training. Uh, did that for four years in inner Melbourne, four or five years in inner Melbourne before I applied for the uh, job with the HEM service. And I started there in 2009 and uh, with the first four years of my career at the Essendon Melbourne base. And then uh, came out to the Latrobe Valley in the east of Victoria, where I've worked ever since. Good. I think that's quite a humble introduction, really, from someone describing their own career pathway. Mm-hmm. Ben's, um, Ben's quite established in Ambulance Victoria, very well known, and he's currently a PhD candidate who's halfway through a, um, a research project, which mm. is quite 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 exciting project as well. Unfortunately, we probably haven't got the time to go into it in detail uh, at the moment, but maybe we'll do it in another video log later. So... Ben, would you mind just kind of like, so you're a, um, a MICA flight paramedic, would you kind of like mind just describing the average journey and timelines and maybe touching the training education to become a flight paramedic? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a very strong link with the tertiary sector in ambulance in Australia and in particular in Victoria. Um, we start, and so today uh, you would, uh, to take that pathway, it would be your standard three-year undergraduate paramedic degree, followed by employment with an ambulance service and a one-year uh, graduate program, uh, at which point you, you work for 12 months in the ambulance service and then complete that. Uh, usually then it, it's uh, a minimum of two to three years of on-road experience before you could apply to be a MICA paramedic. Um, and that um, is probably the lower end of normal. And, and most people would wait a little bit longer than that, uh, but you're eligible within those two to three years post your qualification to apply for the MICA program. And at this stage, that's uh, service sponsored. So they will send you back to Monash University to complete a, um, a graduate diploma in uh, emergency health. You actually get enrolled in a master's of specialist paramedic practice, um, but the ambulance service will pay to the graduate diploma, graduate uh, uh, exit, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yep. Um, and you can pay for the additional four units to complete your master's, uh, yeah. which a lot of people, in fact, most people would pay their way through the rest of the master's, but you can exit with the graduate diploma. Yeah. Um, and that's all you need to practice as a micro paramedic. So you do that and that, that occurs over about 18 months with, with in-house versus online learning, um, whilst you continue to work clinically, uh, as a, as a advanced life support paramedic, uh, from there, you then go into your on-road phase. Uh, with a clinical instructor for around about, it's around about eight months. Uh, sometimes it can be longer, uh, depending on your performance. Um, and then at the, the pretty much 12, 12, 12 month mark or so, you go to a final assessment, uh, which is called a, a panel assessment, it's like a, a Viva, if you like. Uh, you pass that and then you enter a phase of what's called your, your 12 month post-qualification period, 
where your scope is, of practice is limited, you must work with a senior microparamedic to practice your skills for that year. Uh, then you go through a range of sign-offs to perform uh, some of the more advanced procedures autonomously like RSI, uh, drug facilitative intubation, etc. Um, and then from there, uh, realistically, you're kind of looking at, uh, again, the minimum requirement to then apply for the HEMS position would be two years post that, that sign-off. Uh, but very few people uh, would, would be that junior to apply. Uh, there's an endorsement process that you have to go through to be sort of supported by a, a clinical support officer and a team manager. And realistically, most people will probably at least four years post-qualification before they would apply to go to the HEM service. So you're looking at 10 to 12 years in ambulance before you, you're kind of looking at that position. Some could do it sooner, um, and, uh, and they have. Uh, and often, quite the contrary, a lot of people will leave it to a lot later in their career and they may leave it to the 20-year mark. So Yeah, so certainly I've noticed working with the, the flight paramedics, um, I've worked with quite a few now, that they're, they're extremely experienced and have been in the road for, for quite a long time. Mm. So we, you touched on the scope of practice then, so what would be the scope of practice for a, uh, a MICA flight paramedic who's been pretty much training, in training and education for the best part of 10 years? Yeah, so the scope of practice is uh, autonomous um, RSI and drug facilitated intubation, and we mostly do RSI. Um, and that's been part of Ambulance Victoria since 1999, so we're not, we're not new to this. And uh, prior to that, we performed, a, I guess, a bastardised version of that without a paralytic, uh, which was probably not great clinical practice in retrospect, but that drug facilitated intubation has been part of Ambulance Victoria for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're a mature system and the MICA system itself has existed since 1971. So uh, has been around uh, for a long time and, and the clinical governance and collective experience has evolved over that nearly 50 years. So um, the scope of practice back to the, the MICA flight group, um, I guess their uh, flagship, if you want to call it that, um, practice skill set is around those critical care assessments and interventions of... Um, you know, decompressive thor thoracostomy, needle, uh, finger thoracostomy, uh, blood administration, um, uh, the RSI, as we spoke of, the use of pre ultrasound. Ultrasound's been used, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So ultrasound's really kind of come along in the last couple yeah. of years with using it for diagnostic capability, vascular access, etc. Um, and so those those skills have, have kind of continued to evolve. Yeah, yeah. so certainly in the practice, um, we've actually had direct experience. We've had a couple of cases where we've been using... Um, uh, taking uh, arterial blood samples, taking blood glass analysis, yep. uh, as well as doing um, uh, CPAP, BiPAP. Yes. Quite a lot of additional skills yeah. and capabilities that you guys offer and routinely bring to, to improve patient care. Yeah. I think, and I think, you know, one of the spaces that, you know, the, the critical care paramedic role uh, kind of worldwide is, is largely centred around the trauma patient. Yeah. In our service, we, we've had a, a stark reduction in our trauma care uh, uh, the volume of work that's centered around trauma, at least 45 to 50 percent of our work is into hospital critical care transport of uh, you know sick ventilated patients, yep. uh, etc., or, or patients who um, have uh, largely medical uh, illness. Yep. Uh, so uh, we we have a I guess a skill set within that area of looking after that medical patient uh, much more and more these days uh, with the trauma work, obviously still. You know, still there. Yeah, sure. So, no, thanks. That's that's re it's really interesting, and um, I'm sure a lot of people are, are going to be comparing their current practice uh, to your skill set. And it's, I guess, uh, one question um, just to kind of finish off really is: so it's quite an extraordinary system, it seems to me, the mm. the, the micro system in uh, in Victoria. If you could kind of like maybe summarise or or just kind of like verbalise what you think is its greatest kind of asset, or what do you think is the strengths of it? Look, I think um, I think by the time you get to, and we, we've been discussing this. By the time you get to, I guess the level of practice that I'm at, and, and the time in the ambulance service, we, you it, it is it is about playing the long game. Everything is slow time over your career with a, you know, a range of milestones that you meet along the way, um, and the system is heavily linked to three key areas that I would see, and that is robust clinical governance. Yep. Um, where you are, you are scrutinised heavily. Um, you're also held to account for your clinical performance in, in a positive sense, yep. in not in a punitive sense. Sure. 
uh, we're very well supported in that regard. Um, additionally, we have very close links to the tertiary and academic sector in two facets, and that is um, the, the MICA group are largely responsible for a lot of the undergraduate paramedic education, but also the, the education of the postgraduate uh, paramedic cohort as well. Um, so there's close links to that um, academic and education um, uh, part of, of what we do. And then thirdly, research. So we've been able to uh, kind of link ourselves in over the last 20 years very closely with pre-hospital research projects. Um, you know, we're currently undergoing, we we're currently running three uh, trials, one on spinal care, one on uh, randomization, blinded randomization of uh, tranexamic acid versus placebo for trauma patients, uh, one of uh, uh, titrated oxygen therapy post cardiac arrest in a ventilated patient. And historically, we run the only prospective randomized control trial for RSI versus no RSI in uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, things like hypertonic saline early, early uh, in, uh, in the research program of Ambulance Victoria. Uh, there's the AVOID trial, which is uh, randomization of oxygen in STEMI to no oxygen. Uh, the list goes on. I've been involved in, in probably 20 uh, large mm. clinical trials as a practitioner. Um, and, and the group is very closely linked to research, education, and that robust clinical governance and really just making sure we hold ourselves to account to ensure that what we're delivering is high standard patient care and the patient's always at the focus of what we're yeah, doing. Yeah, sure. Well, Ben, huge thanks for hosting me while I've been here no and, and talking to me. Uh, the learning I'm going to take back to the UK regarding this and specifically from uh, uh, the mic system within uh, Victoria's, it's just immense. Uh, normally I, I summarise these podcasts or these video logs with a just a, like a condensed version of what we've talked about, but there's almost too much really to cram in. So apart, apart from saying that the, the MICA system is generating these unique um, MICA flight paramedics and MICA paramedics who've just got a really robust training education system, governance system based on research and audit that allows them to deliver really high standards of care. And I've witnessed this firsthand um, on quite a lot of clinical shifts on the road and the helicopter and the aeroplane. And it's, uh, it's kind of a privilege to be over here. So thank you for hosting us. So thank no you for having me today. Cheers. Right.